Hello again. Well, we finally got back to meeting after the coronavirus shutdown. And the first talk that we had was me again, I'm afraid, giving an introduction to RAF Scampton, ready for our visit there. And to kick off the new season, we all went to visit RAF Scampton. And remembering an excellent day trip, my thanks go to Daniel, who was our guide for the day. RAF Scampton, the story of a Royal Flying Corps fighter station, and then the story of a Royal Air Force bomber base. In 1916, the War Office decided it needed to counter the bombing attack by Zeppelin airships coming in from the North Sea. A new home defence flight station was established at Brattleby Cliff. The aerodrome covered 287 acres, consisting of a landing ground and six single-span, open-ended, general service flight sheds, laid out close to Ermine Street. The Zeppelins came in from the North Sea between the Humber and the Wash, and the idea was for a defensive interception patrols to be flown between Spurn Head and the new air station across the Zeppelin's track. A flight of No. 33 Squadron, Royal Flying Corps, flew these patrols from Brattleby Cliff in FE-2B fighters. The only slight difficulty was that the FE-2B had an operational ceiling of around 11,000 feet, and after coming all the way across the North Sea, the Zeppelins came over the coast at around 21,000 feet. Patrols always missed their targets. The anti-Zeppelin strategy had failed, but the site was still there. And it was developed into a training aerodrome supporting number 60 training squadron followed by number 81 and number 11 training squadrons flying their Sopwith Pups, Sopwith Camels and later Sopwith Dolphins. In 1917 the station was renamed Royal Flying Corps Scampton and was designated as number 34 training depot station and continued with its operational program. 1st of April 1918, like everywhere else, it became a Royal Air Force station, RAF Scampton. But following the armistice in November 1918, RAF Scampton was closed in April 1919 because there was no longer a need for training fighter pilots. All of the buildings on the airfield were temporary. Even the hedgerows and trees were retained. By 1920, all the buildings, including the hangars, had been removed. And farming had returned. By the 1930s, the lie about the undefeated and betrayed Germany was taking root through Nazi propaganda. And the political opinion in most countries was that the bomber would always get through. Later, the Spanish Civil War tended to confirm this view. So we will need lines of defence and of attack.
Radar stations are set up to detect enemy bombers on their way to our country. and fighter stations to intercept and destroy the enemy crossing the coast. And then we need bomber stations to deliver retaliation on the enemy. By 1936, the Royal Air Force Expansion Scheme sees former Brattleby airfield restored with extended grass runways and a small diversion of the famous Ermine Street. Reopening in August 1936, the station was known as Royal Air Force Station Scampton. The station consisted of four large C-type hangars with permanent brick-built technical and domestic buildings, including technical areas, station offices, officers' mess, sergeants' mess, airmen's quarters, and married quarters, and officers' married quarters. The base now occupied an area of 360 acres. As it developed, RAF Scampton made an increasingly dramatic imposition on the surrounding rural landscapes, focused on the Lincolnshire edge. Opening in October 1936, Number 9 Squadron, operating Handley Page Hayfords, and Number 214 Squadron with Vickers Virginias, were the first to arrive. Two one four squadron left the station, and sea flight of number nine squadron moved in, operating the Hawker Audax, a single-engined biplane bomber. Two one four squadron was soon re-equipped with the Vickers Wellesley, a single-engined monoplane. This was designed by Barnes Wallace, using his famous geodetic construction. Number 148 Squadron was soon redeployed and was replaced by Number 49 Squadron and Number 83 Squadron, who were both operating the venerable Hawker Hart. Before long, both squadrons were re-equipped with the Handley Page Hamdens, with which they were destined to go to war. The Hanley Page Hampton was known as the Flying Suitcase because of its narrow section and deep fuselage. The cockpit almost gives the pilot a fighter pilot's position, and often pilots handle the Hampton as if it was a two-engine fighter. War was declared on the 3rd of September 1939 and RAF Scampton was immediately transferred to Five Group. And six hours after the declaration, a certain flying officer Guy Gibson led a flight of six Hamptons to attack German shipping on the German coast. Unfortunately, they did not find the enemy and had to return with their bomb loads or jettison them into the sea but Gibson would have far more famous exploits later in Scampton's history. Scampton Squadron routinely carried out hazardous low-level mine-laying missions. They were codenamed Gardening. On the 12th of August 1940, number 83 Squadron left Scampton on a raid against the Dortmund Ems Canal. Two aircraft were quickly lost to anti-aircraft artillery. Then Wing Commander Roderick Babe Leroy made his attack at very low level. His aircraft was bracketed by searchlights. 
Then the Hampton was hit in the wing by two explosive shells. Despite the damage, Leroy flew the mission so that his bomb aimer could deliver the bombs on target. Then he made his way back to Scampton with damage to the hydraulics, which meant he had no flaps and was suspicious that his undercarriage might collapse on landing. He got the Hampton back to Scampton at about 2 a.m. in the morning, but he was still concerned that the undercarriage might collapse on landing and the aircraft would burst its fuel lines and crash into flames. He flew at Sirtles above the base for about three hours to burn off his fuel and wait for dawn. He then made a successful landing in the pale light of dawn without any casualties. For his valour, courage, skill and determination, he was awarded Scampton's first Victoria Cross. The Hampton's narrow body gave the crew a snug fit in the fuselage. We've already discussed the pilot's position being similar to that of a fighter pilot, but in front of him sat the navigator at bomb aimer. The most uncomfortable position on the aircraft was the rear dorsal gunner, who had to squat, kneel, or even lie to man his guns. And above him, sat the radio operator mid upper gunner. The radio was at his back, so he had to turn around to operate it. On the 15th of November, 1940, the radio operator mid upper gunner is Flight Sergeant John Hanna of 83 Squadron. His aircraft is on a raid, attacking a target near Antwerp. As the aircraft flew through heavy flak, a shell exploded in the bomb bay, causing a serious fire. The dorsal gunner escaped quickly. Hannah fought the blaze with two fire extinguishers and beat out some of the flames, firstly with his jacket, then with his logbook, and finally with his hands. He eventually put the fire out while suffering serious burns and balancing on the frame as the fuselage melted beneath his feet. And then he made his way forward. Where he found that the navigator bomb aimer had also left through the bomb bay. So for the rest of the flight, Hannah passed maps and headings to the pilot to make a safe return to Scampton. For his bravery and dedication to duty, Hannah became the second recipient of the Victoria Cross whilst serving at Scampton. The station then housed No. 49 and No. 83 squadrons flying the ill-fated twin Rolls-Royce Vulture engined Avro Manchester, but not for long. The Manchester suffered from a Rolls-Royce Vulture engine, which was probably the worst engine ever developed during the war. It was prone to catch fire for no apparent reason, but these aircraft were replaced. An 83 squadron quickly formed a conversion flight on the 11th of April 1942 and 49 Squadron, a conversion flight, followed on the 16th of May. Both squadrons were now fully equipped with the Avro Lancaster by the end of June. At this time, Lancaster S for Sugar, number R5868, arrives on the station and will later become the station's gate guardian. It is now at RAF Hendon Museum. The Lancaster was an uprated Manchester with a wider wingspan and four engines, 
but these engines were the famous Rolls-Royce Merlin engines, probably the best engines produced by any side during the entire war. With the Lancasters comes the return to RAF Scampton of Wing Commander Guy Gibson. He has just finished his third tour of duty and now takes command of Squadron X for a special mission. A top secret unit that is to become 617 Squadron, the Dambusters. The Dambusters raid attacking six Ruhr dams and destroying two with the famous Barnes-Wallace bouncing bombs is undoubtedly the most famous raid that ever flew from Scampton and probably the most famous raid of the Royal Air Force ever. But the story is told in full in 617 Squadron RAF Part 1 on the YouTube Muscombe History Group channel so find it there if you want to know the full details. But Guy Gibson becomes the third recipient of the Victoria Cross while stationed at Scampton. A poignant moment on the day of the raid is when Guy Gibson's dog Nigger is run over and killed outside the entrance to the base at Ermine Street. He was buried later that night in a grave outside Gibson's office at number three hangar, timed to when Gibson will be flying over the dams in his attack. However, the link with RAF Scampton and the dam busters is very specific to that one raid. Gibson never flew from Scampton again, and 617 Squadron flew only one more mission during the war taking off from Scampton and returning via North Africa to their new satellite base at Woodall Spa. Scampton then closed down for refurbishment. The grass runways could no longer handle the heavyweight bomb loads. Three concrete runways were laid at 2,000 yards 1500 yards and 1400 yards with 11 loop hard standings laid out on the perimeter track. New bomb stores were also constructed on land to the northwest corner of the airfield. On completion of the work the base area increased to 580 acres. Following the work Control of the station passed from number 5 group to number 1 group. Number 1690 Bomber Defence Training Flight BDTF arrived on the 13th of July 1944 with Spitfires, Hurricanes and Miles Martlets. You might think the Miles Martlet looks a little out of place with the Greyhounds of Fighter Command, but their purpose was to tow drag targets so that the Spitfire and Hurricane pilots could test their marksmanship. They were replaced in April 1945 by number 153 and number 625 Lancaster Squadrons. The last Lancaster raid to fly out of Scampton was on the 25th of April 1945 by number 153 squadron and 625 squadron. They attacked the Ulbersalzburg complex of Nazi buildings near Hitler's Berchtesgarten. They were banned from attacking Berchtesgarten as at this stage in the war the Allies believed it was better for Hitler to be alive and making his strategic errors. On the 4th of September 1945, six years and one day after the start of hostilities, the war in Europe ended. During the war, RAF Scampton
Southampton had lost 551 aircrew and 266 aircraft. 155 of these were Hamden's. 15 were Avro Manchester's and 96 were Lancaster's, including the 8 that were lost in the Dambusters raid. Number 153 Squadron and 625 Squadron were disbanded on the 7th of October 1945. But Lancaster's came back with number 100 Squadron in December of 1945, flying Operation Manor, dropping food to feed the starving Dutch. And this picture shows a Lancaster being bombed up with loads of bread and other food sources. The last Lancasters, flying operationally, left Scampton in May of 1946. In December of 1945, Number 57 Squadron introduced the Avro Lincoln to Scampton. The Lincoln is a Lancaster on steroids. It's longer in the fuselage and wider in the wingspan, with more power, this time with twin supercharged Merlin engines, a much heavier defensive armament, including cannons in the mid-upper turret and the tail turret. But from July 1948, the real heavyweights arrived. The 28th Bombardment Wing of the United States Air Force brought the Boeing B-29 Superfortress, the first atom bomber. It was a superfortress flown by Paul Tibbets and named after his mother, Enola Gay, that dropped the first atomic bomb on Hiroshima. And another superfortress called Brock's car dropped the second nuclear bomb on Nagasaki. It's not generally known that the Royal Air Force also flew B-29s under the name of the Washington B-1 bomber, as part of Scampton being an emergency war plan airfield. But with a main runway of less than 6,000 feet and a chronic shortage of hard standings, Scampton was not an ideal base for the 30 United States Air Force and Royal Air Force B-29s. In January 1949, as circumstances changed, the USAF squadrons were withdrawn. RAF Scampton was again an RAF base from February 1949, initially supporting the Avro Lincoln again. But they leave Scampton in April of 1952. In January of 1953, RAF Scampton becomes the base of the first medium nuclear capable jet bomber in the world. Four English Electric Canberra squadrons, number 10 squadron, number 18 squadron, number 21 squadron and number 27 squadron, all flying the English Electric Canberra. Canberra's moved out in 1955 when the station became a V bomber base flying Avro Vulcans. This required extensive new ground facilities, including a high security area for the storage and maintenance of nuclear weapons, and a heavy duty hard standing for all aircraft. The first nukes were 20 kiloton atomics, replaced by the smaller Yellow Sun Stage 1, which was the first UK operational thermonuclear weapon, followed by the standoff blue steel missiles with a 1.1 megaton thermonuclear warhead. 
This required the construction of new specialist buildings. The servicing and storage of red snow between the main hangars and the airfield. The main risk with red snow was handling the highly explosive and volatile rocket fuel. This aerial view shows the changes and modifications required to accommodate the nuclear fast reaction Vulcan force. The badge of RAF Scampton commemorates these alterations. The bowstring is the line of the old Ermine Street. The bow itself is the line of the new Ermine Street. And the arrow represents the runway. With a motto, an armed man is not attacked. In May 1958, Number 617 Squadron, the Dambusters, returned to their former home at Scampton, with Number 83 Squadron and Number 27 Squadron, they formed the Scampton Wing, with aircraft on quick response, armed with blue steel missiles. I once experienced 12 aircraft taking off on a quick response alert and it was the most incredible noise I've ever heard in my entire life. You didn't listen to it, it shook you. But on June 30th, 1968, Blue Steel operations were terminated. The Royal Navy assumed responsibility for the UK's nuclear deterrent, with submarines launched Polaris missiles. Scampton squadrons were assigned to tactical nuclear and conventional bombing roles. This led to the disbandment of No. 83 Squadron in August of 1969. In December of 1969, No. 230 Operational Conversion Unit moved to RAF Scampton from RAF Finningley. They came with Vulcans and Hanley Page Hastings. Scampton was transferred to RAF Support Command and became the home of the Central Flying School in 1983. This role for the station saw the Central Flying School operating BAC Jet Provost, Scottish Aviation Bulldogs, Short Tucanos, and sharing the airspace with the Hawker Siddeley Hawks of the Red Arrows. And a further addition to the station occurred in 1984 with the arrival of the Tornado Radar Repair Unit. Early in 2000, a re-evaluation of the logistics of the Central Flying School and the Red Arrows operations found that the lack of available airspace at RAF Cromwell, the new Central Flying School base, meant the Red Arrows should be kept at Scampton. By 2005, Scampton was again under the control of RAF Strike Command, home of the UK's air surveillance and control systems, control and reporting centre, the mobile meteorological unit, and number one air control centre, which deployed to Afghanistan in 2006 as part of Operation Heinrich. The deployment lasted until 2009. Strategic Defence Spending Review of 2011 ended 
a series of investigations. The review concluded that the Red Arrow should stay at Scampton without affecting other operational flying bases. But in July 2018, the MOD announced that Scampton would close and then be sold off with all remaining units relocated to other RAF bases by 2022. This idea has not been reprieved. The BAC Hawk functions brilliantly as an advanced trainer, leading to the FGRA Typhoon II and the F-35B Lightning II. But the design is almost 50 years old. It was introduced in 1974 and the trainer hawks will soon be out of their service hours. The Red Arrow hawks will be given a special status. The Red Arrows are soon to move to RAF Waddington. And some spare hawks from 100 Squadron will be put into store to keep the Red Arrows flying well into the 21st century. RAF Scampton Heritage Centre is set in an authentic Second World War hangar and has over 1,500 artefacts on display. There is plenty for the visitor to see and hopefully it will all survive the recent changes. A visit to RAF Scampton Heritage Centre will take the form of a guided tour led by a knowledgeable and friendly volunteer guide. The guide will show you round the Heritage Centre and keep you entertained for the whole of your visit. Whilst RAF Scampton is an active airbase, you will be supervised at all times. Your guided tour will take approximately two and a half hours, so wear some comfy shoes. It's not a conventional museum visit. It's a superb experience. You will see a lot and probably learn a lot. Commemorating 106 years of air service, RAF Scampton Heritage Centre is something worth visiting. Hopefully, all the changes that are forecast will not be the end of Scampton's Heritage Centre. Well, that concludes another programme. We'll be meeting again with a regular monthly meeting date, but I'll continue to add the occasional programme to the Muscombe History Group channel. So, see you then. Bye for now.